to cover this morning. Turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, a subject that is very, very confusing today and about which there's a great deal of confusion in the church, and that is the believer's re uh, relationship to government. What should be the Christian's relationship to the government? Now that this grows a a great many questions that are imperative for us to answer, especially today. I'd like for us to read this passage through together. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, and I'm going to be reading from chapter 13, verse 1, through verse 7. So just follow along with me and study carefully what is said here. Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it, that is human government, is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid for it. What does it refer to? Human government does not bear the sword for nothing. What do you do with swords? You spank people with them? No, you kill them. And it says that that's by the direct authority of God that people are put to death when they do evil. And we have a lot to say about that. A lot to say about it. Let's read on. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore, it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render all, to all what is due them. Tax, to whom tax is due. Custom, to whom custom. Fear, to whom fear. Honor, to whom honor and so on. All right, we'll stop our reading there, but let's think for a minute. Human government, a minister of God. What government was over Paul when he wrote this? Rome, S-P-Q-R, the Roman Empire. And yet, Paul said they were ministers of God insofar as they held certain order. But I want us to go back to a very, very important concept in the Word of God so we can understand this passage. Actually, we need a lot of preparation before we can understand this passage. You see, God has ordained what we call divine institutions. Now, divine institutions apply to all the human race, believers and unbelievers. There are certain institutions which God set up to keep order and to protect the mass of people that live on planet Earth. And so God ordained certain divine institutions to have a general order on the Earth. And there are four of these divine institutions, four. The first divine institution is that of volition. All of these come out of the first 11 chapters of Genesis. All of these were set up in the first 11 chapters. 
The first divine institution is that God gave to man the freedom to choose his own destiny. Man was created with the freedom of choice. Now that is a divine institution. And do you know something? The framers of the American Constitution understood these divine institutions. And the Constitution of the United States reflects a knowledge of the Word of God in an incredible depth. It really does. And I, as I restudied this, I realized how in many places the Constitution of the United States reflects a profound understanding of the Scriptures. And this is how we know that. The divine institution of human volition is reflected. Remember this statement? We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know what that's coming out of? The divine institution of human volition that each one of us have, should have the freedom to choose our own destiny and have the liberty to choose our destiny. And each one of us should have the freedom to pursue happiness. That's a profound statement, and it comes right out of Genesis chapters 1 through 3, where it showed that, that God created man with freedom of choice. Now, man used that freedom of choice wrongly. See, man was created compatible with a righteous and holy God. There was nothing evil in man, but the possibility of evil was there when God gave man the freedom of choice because the freedom to love God and to choose to fellowship with God necessarily involves the ability to choose not to love God and not to have fellowship with him. But God took that risk because he did not want robots. A robot cannot love. It can only mechanically respond. And God did not want that. A robot cannot have fellowship because that's something that has to have volition. A robot cannot do anything except what is programmed to do. We were created with that unique thing called human volition. And that's a divine institution. Now, there have been many governments that try to curtail that freedom of choice and liberty. That's why many of those who came originally to the United States came here to flee the tyranny of Europe because of the oppression of religion and the oppression of governments. False religion, I might add, that claim to be Christian. And today we see the freedom of choice being eroded away here in the United States because you know what? The minute you introduce socialism into government and that was introduced into our wonderful government by Franklin Delano Roosevelt back in the 30s and it's been creeping and gaining strength ever since because the minute you start making government into something it was never intended to be it starts taking away human freedoms. The more you expect the government to do for you, the more you give away your freedom. The more you expect the government to subsidize you financially, everything you give for the government to do for you, you're giving away freedom. You're making a bargain with it, and it's a bad bargain. But let's go on. The second divine institution, and this was set up in Genesis chapter 2, is marriage. That is a divine institution and it's for believers and unbelievers. God had this for the order of the human race. And God set up a definite order. And that order is that men should be married to women. Now you laugh, but that's a very important distinction. That is part of the divine arrangement. Whenever you got men 
having sexual relations with men and you've got women having sexual relations with women, you've got a total perversion of God's order. And you, the minute that it comes into a society, you begin to destroy the whole society. But God set up the institution of marriage between a man and a woman, and God set up a wife for life. That is his divine ideal. Now, unfortunately... In our fallen state, that's frequently broken. But it's God's ideal that there should be one man married to one woman for life. And we should always strive for that ideal. And when you get married, you should carefully weigh that in God's eyes, he wants it to be for life. And so you take a very careful look at what you're doing. Now, as you know, I'm divorced, but I hate divorce. If there was any way I could have prevented it, I would have. And divorce is a sin. Thank God God forgives it. But God's plan is for marriage to be a basic block of the human race a basic building block of the society of the world. And we should seek to hold marriage holy and sanctified as a divine institution. And I believe that this is something that's under tremendous attack by Satan. This is something Satan really is attacking today. And we need to realize that one of the reasons that this is being attacked. You know how marriage is being attacked? It is this whole movement, and there are certain good parts of this movement, but it's the whole movement of women's rights. There's a complete perversion of God's order because you know what God says? God says that the man has the responsibility and the authority to be the head of the home. And if he isn't, that home is out of order. Now, many times it's not the woman's fault. You know, everybody blames the woman if she's wearing the pants. A lot of times it's because the man won't put the pants on. <laughs> Somebody has to put them on and the woman puts them on. But God's order is that the man is to be the loving, caring head of the marriage. And he is, to, he is the one before God who has the responsibility to give leadership to that marriage relationship. And that's being broken down. Look at the attack Satan's making on God's order. God's order is that, the, that men should be under him the authority in the home, the authority in a relationship between a man and a woman. But today, equal rights, and I am for equal pay. I am for equal opportunity in jobs. That is correct, and that's as it should be, and thank God for that. But I'm against those bull dykes and lesbians who have gotten in the leadership of, of this equal rights thing. And what they're after is not equal rights, but trying to make me, uh, women into men. After all, I don't think it's necessarily to a woman's best interest if she can use the same urinal that a man can. <laughs> to me, that's not somehow a, a great privilege or accomplishment. Now, God just, you know, I'm talking to you whether the Bible talks. If you read the Bible in the original, it talks in the terms I'm using right now. It's very straightforward. You should read what Isaiah said about one case. Well, I won't go into that. It'd be too shocking. But <laughs> but there's a complete perversion 
of God's order for the human race today. And this is just one of the many areas. But you can't have a society if you don't follow God's order because, you know, it's not just that, well, men better get macho and get out there and be the heads. No, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, if, you, if, if, if a man just gets out there and tries to uh, lead a woman without love and without any obvious care, there's going to be a rebellion, and rightly so. But there should be that order. And I believe that there's just a tremendous perversion of this. And here's where the problem is. In the basic makeup of a woman and the basic makeup of a man, God not only said this is the way it should be, but he created our internal nature so that that's the way we are happy if we're... In other words, if we get out of the intended order, then something in our basic makeup is out of order, and we may think we're happy, but we're not. We're only happy when we fit into the order that God created us to fit into. A woman who, is take, who has taken over the leadership of a, of a marriage relationship is not a happy woman. And I'll guarantee you a man isn't when that's the case. And it begins to destroy the order in the human family, human race. All right, the third divine institution. The third divine institution is that of the family. And this was set up as uh, the first man and woman had children. Genesis chapter 4, we begin to see it, but it is developed all the way through the scripture, the divine institution of the family. Do you know something? In God's eyes, the family is the most important segment of society. The family. The individual family. And it is the responsibility of the family to exercise authority over the children and to teach the children to, be, to have respect for law and order. And when that isn't done, guess what happens to a nation? It begins to come apart. There is no substitute for the divine institution of family. And the parent is to have authority over the children. Now look what's happening today. And this has happened in societies before us and they were destroyed before us and we will be destroyed as they were if we don't change it. What happens when the family ceases to be what God called it to be? To raise the children the parents to have authority over the children, the parents to, to exercise the role of teacher and modeling to train the children to respect law and order and to train the children in how to relate to other human beings. You know what happens? The, there becomes a complete, complete breakdown of law and order in a country. Now, what, what's happened in our society today is absolutely appalling. It's part of this whole Marxist thinking that though we are not a communist country, we have adopted a lot of thinking from Marxism. You know what Marxism says? That the child belongs to the state, not to the family. And the ultimate authority over the child is the state. You say, well, how's that happening in the United States? I had this vividly pointed out to me one day when I went to Pacific Palisades High School to pick up one of my twin daughters. She had a doctor's appointment. I went there and uh, I called for her to be let out of her class. I went to the office and said, I'm taking my daughter out of school. I'm taking her to uh, the doctor. And they said, do you have a note from the doctor? I said, I beg your pardon? I said, I am the father of this child, and I said, I'm taking this child out of school. She said, no, you're not. I said, why? She said, because we have authority over that child. I said, lady, 
<laughs> I'm glad at this moment you're not a man. <laughs> but I took my daughter and I said, we'll settle this issue if need be in court. And I walked out. But I'll tell you something. That, was, that vividly brought home the thinking of today. And you know, it's not altogether the school system's fault or these various uh, facilities of the government's fault. It is the parents' fault that we gladly turned over the children to them. Mostly because parents wanted to get out of the responsibility of being a parent. And what do we have screams for today? The government should pay for what? Child care centers. There is no substitute for a parent taking care of their own children. And I'm going to say something, and this is not going to be popular, but I've never been known to care much about that. I believe that except in some rare cases where it's absolutely necessary, that the woman should be at home taking care of the children and not working. If you have set your standard of living so high that the only way you can maintain it is by the woman also working, then your standard of living is too high and you're sacrificing your child in order to get a little bit more of life's good things. That's what God says. And that's what's wrong with the children that are coming up wave after wave, generation after generation today. They're completely out of control. Why? Because there was no real time spent with them there was no real training given at home. There was the, the turnkey kids. And you leave a child to himself, read the Proverbs, it'll tell you what'll happen to him. And when it says, he who hates his child spares the rod. But he who loves his child disciplines him vigorously with a rod. Now, the psychologist is not going to like that. In this baloney in school, I remember when I was in school, they still had a vestige of, of uh, Christian influence. I went to high school. I can remember coming home where I could not sit down. Man, I mean, the assistant principal had hit me with a paddle so hard that I could barely sit down. You do that today, most parents would come in and, you know, not most, but the liberal, the liberal thinking parents would put that person in jail. And so what have we got today? Teachers that are scared to death to go to class and have to go with armed guards in some cases because the students are completely out of control and carrying guns. Why? Because first of all, there's been a total breakdown in the family, the divi third divine institution. No longer, and, and this is not true, I'm talking about the whole human race now, but how much more am I talking to the Christian family? We have a responsibility, all the human race does, but especially Christians have a responsibility to train our children so that they respect law and order. And you know one of the greatest disservices that's been done to the underprivileged families in our country? The, the so-called uh, minority? You know what the biggest problem is? The general public has, has led them to believe that the world owes them a living. The welfare program set up by these bleeding heart liberals in our government, which never has accomplished what they can, and they don't give a hoot about those they're raising these things for. They're trying to buy votes. These welfare programs have done more to destroy the minority groups than anything else. You don't help people that way. There are some people that are fourth generation on welfare. That proves the breakdown of the system right there. 
They destroyed the family with it. Many of these minority groups found that the, if they divorced their husband, they could get more money from the government than he could make while he worked. So guess what? They kicked the man out. There's a total breakdown of this divine institution, and you know what? This country is coming apart at the seams. I don't know how many of you heard me on my radio program yesterday, but I interviewed a man named Tommy Robinson, congressman from Arkansas. He is one of the rarest birds in this country. He is a conservative Democrat. I mean, you know, we need to put this guy in a, in a museum somewhere. It's just, you don't find him that often. But what a guy. What a guy. I really liked him. You know what he did when he was chief of police? Couldn't believe it. Uh, Cliff Ford is a friend of his, and Cliff was telling me about it. He, was, he began a vigorous law enforcement program. He convicted a bunch of hardened criminals, people that had been in jail, let out, and gotten you know, right back into their old crime again and so forth. And then he got a whole bunch, he finally got a bunch of judges to where they started carrying out the law and he started filling the jail so much they didn't have any more room. And so he had a whole bunch of hardened criminals that were convicted and the, the head of the jail says, you, they're your problem, we don't have any room for them, you just turn them loose. And he said, I can't turn these people loose, these are hardened criminals. So you know what he did? He got a busload of them, he went to the penitentiary, he handcuffed them to the chain link fence, and he drove off and called on his car phone, and he said, now, I won't say what he called him, he said, they're your problem now. But one of the reasons that our jails are so full is not only because they haven't been trained to respect law and order, and you know, psychiatry has virtually destroyed our judicial system. You know why? Because the whole judicial system has been taught these things in the universities. They have the idea that a criminal is really not responsible for what, it, what he did. It was his underprivileged background as he grew up. Hey, Abraham Lincoln grew up as a very underprivileged poor child and became a president of the United States. You know what? I was born in a home that didn't even have an indoor toilet. I was born in a little three-room shotgun house with an outdoor toilet. And I grew up in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Houston, Texas. That doesn't have anything to do with anything because character is not developed by, your, by how much money you got. It has nothing to do with it. And so when someone comes up before the judicial system, the idea is given, well, he's not really responsible. It's society's fault for making him the way he is. And so that's the way justice is carried out. Unless you happen to come from a more privileged class, then you'll get the book thrown at you. It's out of order. And that brings us to the fourth divine institution. The fourth divine institution is human government. That's the one that Romans 13, 1 through 7 is talking about. The fourth divine institution is human government. Now I want to show you where human government was set up. Hold your place here and turn with me to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. And begin with verse 5. Now, remember when this occurred. After the flood, when Noah and his family were saved through the flood, the water had receded from the earth. There were only eight people alive on this whole planet. Isn't that something? Only eight people alive. 
And it was there that God set up the basis of how the human family would would govern themselves as they began to, to repopulate the earth. This And so everything that is said here in these chapters 9, 10, and 11 are of great importance because this, this is the civilization of which we're a part. We are part of the antediluvian world. We're part of the, the world after the flood. It started with eight people. And we're descendants of those eight people. But this is what God told them. He said, And surely I will require, verse 5, your lifeblood from every beast, I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. What is the life of man according to God? Verse 4, only you shall not eat the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And the shedding of blood is something very, very, very important to God. Now, he's speaking in that vein and he says in verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Now here's one of the really critical statements in the word of God. This is binding today. Some people say, oh, well, since Jesus came, this, this idea of capital punishment is not there anymore. All right. What did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard it taught by those of old, you shall not murder. But I say that if you're angry with your brother, you're in danger of being judged for murder. What he is saying is that capital punishment in the kingdom he's going to set up for a thousand years, capital punishment will be meted out in some cases for violent anger at someone because that's the motive for murder. That's what causes murder. So far from abolishing capital punishment, he said capital punishment is going to give, be given in the kingdom age when he rules the earth for even being angry without cause at your brother. So that's far more severe than even here. There's a very important factor here and I hope that you're following me and I hope you understand how important what I'm teaching you is here. It's terribly important. There's such confusion in the church today over these things. Now read it, verse 6 with me again. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. You know, the moment God said that, that was the ultimate authority given to human government. All other authority is lesser and comes down from that ultimate authority. This was the ultimate authority given to any human government. The authority to take life in just recompense for a man taking another's life deliberately. Now, the Bible in the law of Moses recognizes accidental manslaughter. It, it recognizes second-degree murder, which is where it was in a fit of anger. But it also recognizes first-degree murder. And there, it's very carefully spelled out that in those cases where it's a deliberate act of taking another man's life, that person's life is to be taken by duly constituted human government. And there's no if, ands, and buts about it. It should be swift and certain and without mercy. Why? Well, it's not with what you hear debated today in some of these asinine debates that we frequently hear. They say, well, we shouldn't have capital punishment because after all, statistics prove that it doesn't deter crime. You know what? God doesn't give a flip about that. The reason for why human government is set up and given this authority is right here in the end of verse 6. What does it say? For in the image of God, he was made. 
If you kill someone deliberately that's in the image of God, then God says, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Your, your life is forfeited because you killed someone that's in my image. And it doesn't have anything to do with whether it deters crime or not. It does, by the way, but that's not the point. The point is that God says if someone deliberately kills another, then society is to do it. And if you don't do it, God says that society will come apart at the seams. Do you know that in, in uh, Israel, and there is no, you know, Israel's law is not, the, is, not the, uh, is not instituted for us. The law of Moses was given to one nation at one period of time. Our laws are patterned after that. But we are not a theocracy. But we can get a model of how God thinks. You see, in Israel, there was no such thing as a jail. Isn't that amazing? No jails. If you stole, what you had to do was make restitution. Fivefold. And if you couldn't pay, you had to work until you could pay it off. You had to work for the person until you paid it off. Guess what happened to an habitual criminal? They didn't put him in jail. They executed him. They had cities of refuge. Because if someone accidentally killed another, they would not let the family take revenge on that. They had certain cities of refuge and that person could flee there and they would be protected. Their life would be spared because it was an accident. But there was no such thing as these graduate schools for greater crime that we call penitentiaries today. Have you ever been to jail? That is the best place to learn how to be a hardened criminal I've ever seen. It's the worst place on earth. It's horrible. Jails are terrible. And you get someone in there for a minor, for a minor crime, and there's really no minor crime, but one of the lesser crimes, we'll say. You get someone sent into jail, you know what? He gets in there with those hardened criminals and he just trying to survive is going to become a hardened criminal himself. And after all, they know that the jails are so crowded that they're never going to have to serve their whole term anyway. So, you know, the penitentiary system is completely ineffective, even if it ever was effective, and it wasn't. So what we've got now is a, we, we've got an increase of crime every year. Completely out of control. And then you throw in the communist-inspired avalanche of drugs into this country where people are made slaves to go get the next fix and you've got crime rampant and this country's coming apart. Let's face it, we've had it. We're coming apart unless there's something drastically done in this country. We're already on the way out. And the only ones I believe that will ever be able to do anything about it are the Christians who start praying, who repent of the wrong action and thinking they have had and they begin to pray daily for our country that God will spare it. And I hope he'll spare it until the rapture myself because this is the main base for missions on the face of this earth right now. But God ordained human government to keep order and that's what Romans 13 is all about and the ultimate authority of human government is the God-given command to take the life of someone who murders another now there's something else we need to learn about this fourth divine institution of human government turn with me to Genesis chapter 10 verses 8 through 10 now, after Noah and his family began to multiply, you've got the table of nations here 
in chapter 10, it shows, you know, these are our forefathers. You know, we all came from one of these, from one of these tribal families. And after they began to multiply, human government first was diversified. There, were, there was, you know, human tribal government. Then man began to multiply beyond that. There began to be a great population increase. And then the first form of a one world government is traced for us through one man in Genesis 10, verses 8 through 10. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. Cush in Hebrew means black. Cush was the father of all the black races. And Cush had a son named Nimrod, and he became a mighty one on the earth. Now, I want to say this, and I hope you will understand this. You know, there used to be a teaching that somehow black people were inferior to white people. And this sort of crazy thinking comes up every once in a while with bigots. But I want to say to the black race's credit that the first great leader on the face of this earth was a black man. Nimrod was a black man. Nothing inferior about him. He was the smartest and the strongest. That's the reason he organized the first one world government. Now read about Nimrod. Nimrod became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before God. Or before the Lord. Now let me give you a literal translation of this. He wasn't a mighty hunter before the Lord. The Hebrew word can mean in defiance of the Lord or against the Lord. And that's the way it should be translated. The context shows that. He was a mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord. You see, this was a man who was not a believer. And he set about to organize a one world government, but he, was, he did it in defiance of the Lord. And it says, therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter in defiance of the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, from which, and by the way, that became Babylon many centuries later. And Eric and Achad and Kalne in the land of Shinar, from that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth Er and Kala and Razain between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. And Mitzrayim became the father of Ludim. Mitzrayim was the father of the Egyptians. In fact, the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim. We won't go any further, but I wanted you to see that before we go to Genesis 11. Nimrod must have been some kind of man. I mean, humanly speaking, he must have been brilliant. He must have been strong. But unfortunately, he was an unbeliever. But he is the one that founded the great city of Nineveh. You know, Nineveh was one of the wonders of the ancient world. This was a great city. Babel became one of the greatest cities of all times. Nimrod was the one that founded those cities. Though he was a powerful man, but he was an unbeliever. All right, now look at Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth used, used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heavens. Now, once again, you have to get the correct translation here. They were going to build a tower that would reach out into the heavens. Now, that did not mean that they thought that they could build a tower high enough to reach into heaven. It was... It was an astrological observatory. Nimrod founded this order of, of the world and the, the religion apparently that Nimrod embraced 
was the first practice of astrology. And the whole world was unified. They all spoke one language. They all unified as in a, in a one world government around this one great project. And that project was to build a great tower from which they could reach out into the heavens and study the stars. This was called a ziggurat. And the ziggurats were all part of the worship of the stars. They believed that the stars were gods. And that's the foundation of astrology. No matter what you think today when you cast a horoscope, you're, practice, you're practicing occultism no matter how innocently you practice it. The only reason that uh, th this whole system of thinking that the stars somehow affect human personality and what, you know, your future and what kind of person you're going to be. That, the only reason that thinking came down to this very day was from this time when they thought the stars were gods and your proximity to these gods on the day you were born, the alignment of these gods in the heavens determined their influence on you. And that's the only basis upon which astrology can claim that somehow your personality, your character, and your destiny is shaped by the relationship with the stars. It's based on the idea that they're gods. So don't ever, ever practice astrology. It's very dangerous. If you do, you're opening up the door of your life to demons and you may become very, very heavily demon oppressed and I'm talking to Christians now if you're a non-Christian you may become demon possessed but this was the religion that Nimrod helped to establish and this is what this was that one world government that he helped to establish and they all united around a demonic religion. Now, I want you to learn something from this. Every time in human history that man has tried to form a one-world government, it has resulted in tremendous evil and suffering for the whole human race. Every time. And you know what God's attitude is toward one-world government? He destroys it. That's exactly what he did here. Listen to what God said. Now remember, they were all speaking one language. They are all unified around this one plan. But you see, the reason God does not want a one world government is because it only takes a generation or two for Satan to get control of the leader. And once he gets control of the leader, the whole system becomes oppressive to those who are believers. That's, Satan loves one world governments because he doesn't have to get control of but one government. And then he can use that government to oppress every believer that's in it. And so this is what was happening here. The first, apparently the first organized religion was astrology. And it would have been used to bring great devastation. It would have been used to stamp out the whole knowledge and memory of God on the earth. And that was Satan's plan. But here's what the Lord said. Verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they have begun to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. In other words, now he doesn't mean that, you know, if the, if the whole world just unites, they're going to be able to do anything. What it means is the, the degree of evil to which they can attain, will, nothing will be impossible. That's the point. In other words, he says, they're all one language, they're all united, and what have they done? They have built a city and a tower in honor of a, a false religion in defiance of God. That's what they did. And that's what one worldism always does. It always leads away from the truth. It always seeks to stamp out the truth of God. Because this world is under the control of who? 
1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Beloved, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The cosmos, translated world, cosmos in Greek means a well-organized system. And it says that well-organized system we call the world, the world is under the total control of Satan. And the Bible tells us that no one will ever be able to destroy that world system and set up a one world government but Jesus himself personally when he comes back to this earth and he sets up the kingdom of heaven on earth and rules on this earth personally for a thousand years. That's why this whole kingdom now stuff is completely in defiance of God. They're saying that the church is going to bring in the kingdom of God and that we're going to take over the governments of the world and we're going to we're going to lead everybody to Christ or virtually everybody and we're going to set up this government and that the church with Christ in heaven, the church is going to set up the kingdom of God on earth and we're going to take over. My gracious, we're fitting right into Satan's plan when we say something like that. It's impossible. And what did God say about all this? God said, Come, let us, in verse 7, come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the, there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building a the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language. Babel means confusion. The Lord confused the language of the whole earth from there. The Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, that was the Lord's verdict about one-worldism and one-world government. The Lord made it impossible in that generation because he confused the languages. He, he divided them up into tribes and he'd have one speak. Can you imagine how that would have been? Instantly, you're speaking a language no one else can understand except a certain group. Hey, these are not fairy tales. That happened. God did it. And it was impossible for them to understand each other so they couldn't form a one world government anymore and they had to scatter and they had to form small national entities and that's God's order for the earth until Jesus comes and sets up the one world government. He is the only one that can do it. From the time that of the Tower of Babel was just the time that was destroyed and from the time God confused the languages God's order for the earth, his fourth divine institution, is national entities. Now, God wants cooperation between nations, but he never wants union of nations. That is not his plan. The reason is God is a realist. He knows that man has a fallen nature, that we have a sin nature that is irreformable. Even in the Christian, when you're born again, the old nature is still there. God knows that it's impossible to reform man's old nature and that the majority of man will not be believers. And so what God did was set up a system of checks and balances. So there would always be one client nation that would be the base of spreading the gospel, his main base of spreading the gospel in each generation. But there would be all of these other nations and the Satan would not be able to get control of all the nations at one time. And therefore, there would always be a system of checks and balances so there would be some freedom on this earth at least in each in each era you understand that and that's God's order and you know something communism seeks to destroy all four divine institutions communism is Satan's direct antithetical plan in defiance of God communism is a Christian heresy it is in direct defiance of God's order. Now, with this background, I want you to read this week, I want you to read Romans chapter 13 every day. I want you to read through Romans 13 once every day at least, okay? And think about what I've said and pray that the Holy Spirit will show you. And then next week, we will really go through that passage. And I believe God will show us some marvelous things. 
But you know, you may be here or you may be listening in on television and you are not part of God's family and you know it. You know that if you were to die this moment that you wouldn't have eternal life. You would be separated from God for eternity under His judgment. If you're not sure that you're forgiven, then right now pray this prayer. Jesus died for your sins. They've been paid for. There's a free pardon for you if you will simply say, Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for dying for me. I confess I have broken your laws. And I can't be good enough for you to accept. So right now, I accept the pardon that you died to give me. Come into my life and forgive me. Make my life pleasing to God. You pray that right now. On the authority of the Word of God, if you prayed that prayer, admit it. I tell you, you have eternal life. And God wants you to get into a church that teaches the Word of God and to grow and to be part of His wonderful family. God bless you as you do this. And for us here, I pray that we will raise up a whole family of believers who will have the Word of God straight enough in their minds that we will begin to move out and become witnesses, first to lead people to Christ, but then to get people to thinking straightly because there are few people in this country that are thinking straight today. And if we don't start somewhere, we'll never do it. But I believe we can start from this place and we can make a difference. You can make a difference in changing the order around. And if the Lord Jesus delays his coming, then perhaps we can save this country as well as save hundreds of thousands and millions of people that are lost without Christ. That's my goal. That's my goal. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, I pray that you through your Holy Spirit will teach us your word and that we'll put this word into action. We won't just learn it, but they, we'll be, begin to act upon it. I pray for each one who is here this morning. May each one begin to share Christ with those about them. May each one begin to invite people to come to church with them that they might begin to be interested in learning the word of God as well Father I pray that you will bless all of those who are afflicted bless those who have a physical problem this morning bless those who have an emotional burden Lord we just pray that you will touch each person according to their need and put your healing hand upon them. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Romans 13. Listen carefully to what the Apostle Paul said. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it doesn't bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. The role of the government is to restrain evil. And when it functions to restrain evil, 
it is fulfilling its God-ordained purpose. Please notice in verses 1 and 2 that government is from God, by God, of God. It is designed as a necessary restraint in a world of sinners. Verses 3 and 4 tell us it is not a threat to those whose behavior is good, but evil. It is those who do evil who should be afraid, not those who do good. In fact, it offers praise to those who do good and brings wrath on those who do evil. And rulers, actually, according to verse 6, are servants of God, devoted to that service. This is God's design for government. The problem is when government ceases to function by God's design, it yields up its authority. Same would be true in a family. God's design is that the father lead the family. When the father leads in a destructive and evil way, he yields up the right to exercise that God-given authority. And by the way, just as a footnote, the man who wrote that, the Apostle Paul, was in violation of the government more often than any other person in the entire New Testament. And when he went to preach the gospel, he was very often thrown in jail, and ultimately he was executed by the government that he refused to obey when it no longer functioned to protect good behavior and punish evil behavior. The second passage, 1 Peter chapter 2, and verses 13 and 14 will suffice, I think. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him, by the Lord, for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. There again, we are to submit for the Lord's sake. What do you mean the Lord's sake? When the government is doing what the Lord designed it to do. When government turns the divine design on its head and protects those who do evil and makes those who do good afraid, it forfeits its divine purpose. In our world today, rulers are designing a culture that protects the immoral. It even has reached the point where it desires to protect criminals and makes those who do good afraid. When the criminals are unrestrained because they don't fear the consequences, but the police are restrained because they fear the consequences of stopping criminals, you know everything is turned on its head. Now I want you to understand that there's some supernatural reasons why this is happening. They're not political, they're not even social in the fullest measure. If you go back to 1 John and uh, reconnect with the passage from last week, 
1 John 2, 15 to 17. We read, do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Then verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. The world is the enemy of God. The enemy of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The world is the enemy of Scripture. The world is the enemy of the gospel. The world is the enemy of the church. What do we mean by the world? Well, remember last week I talked about the world as the complex of evil. The word is cosmos. It means a system. The complex of evil works against what is good. So you have government, which is a part of the world, trying to restrain the world of which it is a part. Very hard for it to hold together because it's all part of the same system. The complex of evil works everywhere, and the government is no exception because the very evil people given the responsibility to restrain evil are themselves incapable of being without evil. That makes enough problems. We have a human system made up of evil, sinful people trying to control a culture of evil, sinful people. The potential for breakdown is inevitable, and it has been demonstrated historically. That's why the Bible says the world gets worse and worse. Evil men get worse and worse as time goes on. You're saying being injured and nobody would, would get their hackles up. And, and, you know. You're saying that the new order of the ages was shaped in this room by some very human men. Very, very human men. Clever, learned, slippery. And possessed of a very deep understanding of the nature of the human animal. You know, we... Despite all the crazy things that has happened in the 20th century and all the proof to the contrary, there's still a kind of a wishy-washy tendency to assume that most people are good and most people would be good if that have a chance and that kind of stuff. They started with the assumption that sure they're good people, but most people are not. Man is a fallen creature, right? Men are not angels. As Madison said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Assume that they're not going to be angels, and they didn't behave as angels themselves. They had a practical task to, to pull off. Of which it. was? Which was to protect liberty by limiting government. That's essentially it. Today we have a huge government with unlimited powers, huge armies, huge intelligence apparatus, huge social bureaucracies. Yes, we do. How far are we from their sense of things? as far as it's possible to be, light years away. Government in the United States, Bill, is intrusive. It's in every place. It's in everybody's lives all the time, but it's lost the capacity to govern. Government, in the eyes of the founding fathers, was designed to protect people in their life, liberty, property. Government today has lost the capacity of protecting all three. Are you safe walking down the streets in New York? Are you safe in some streets in New York? You're safe in Philadelphia, you're safe in some streets in Philadelphia. But it's also, look at the preamble, you know, uh, uh, establish justice and assure domestic tranquility and provide for the common defense and promote the general welfare. Is this government capable of doing that? I submit that it's very nearly lost the capacity to. We have a different society still, don't you think, governed essentially by that document that was drawn up here? Well, that's unless, well, that's unless. I mean, it, the concept of limited government has gone by the boards. Limited in two senses, which I think were crucial to them, and I think are crucial today. Limited in the sense of 
It's got to be by law. This is, these are the things you can do. But limited in the additional sense that there are some things which are outside the capacity of the federal government to do well because the country is too diverse. And there are some things which are outside, properly outside the province of government at all, which communities can, communities can do better, families can do better, individuals can do better. But government has, has transgressed the lines, has crossed the lines. Perhaps we need another federal convention. No bloody way. There is so much incompetence in this country today that um, they'd make a horrible bunch of things. I'll tell you what they'd do. And, and, and you know, there are people around talking of, of calling the sure. Constitutional Convention, some people very serious about it, and they're talking in terms of making it efficient. Now, the, given the fact that government is as big as it is today, and given the fact that precedents have been laid for its being as intrusive as it is today, it's only saving virtue is its incompetence. Right? I mean, you make it efficient and they'll come and get you, man. And that's for real.